the ABC News election headquarters in New York. This is Viewpoint. Brought to you by Dow. Once again, Ted Koppel. We are in our concluding segment. Leslie, during the break, uh, you were talking about facial expression. Do it quickly, okay. and then I'd, I'd like to get to what Kirk's response was. Ed Danko, our editor at CBS, did a rock video of the two candidates and all their photo ops. And in each picture of Bush, he was smiling, he was enjoying himself. But Kirk, in every picture of uh, your candidate, Michael Dukakis, he looked miserable. He looked, the expression on his face was, get me out of here. And if pictures speak louder than the words, as the White House taught me in 1984, the pictures were really an important part of the message Dukakis was putting out. And well, you, guys, you guys clearly learned something on the campaign as you were going along in terms of how to... Right. I think, I think that, that impression was a correct impression. Namely, you start out this presidential campaign process meeting people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then it goes from one-on-ones to groups. But it's always very personal, Mark Shields would say, retail politics. Then you come out and you go into that convention and you speak in front of thousands and you go off from a plane to a motorcade to a stage in front of thousands. And clearly, that's not the kind of politics that uh, Michael Dukakis liked or was comfortable with. And in fact, uh, it showed. And what we had to do was get him back with people. Sam didn't like it at first, but we put him into these town meetings places like bowling alleys and Sam was saying what in the world are you people doing and we went back into a situation in which he had much more give and take uh, with the press in interviews well wait a moment I didn't it's not my personal purpose to object but I don't mind him talking to people but in the bowling alley you see you wanted to say he's a man of the blue collar workers here you were talking about something that had nothing to do with a bowling alley you were using it as a backdrop and it was us. I have you no shame. But we were talking. <laughs> we did. I mean, I mean here, here, here at the beginning of our program is Michael Deaver. Yes, Michael K. Deaver, the media meister of the first term of the Reagan administration, saying, if I understood him correctly, it's up to the press to keep us honest, to make us do better. Oh, come on. Well, Pardon. you expressed your uh, your reasons uh, to me tonight in a way that you hadn't uh, that day, uh, and uh, I'll give that to you. Jim, I, I'll tell you what, Jim Lake, you've been sitting here awfully patiently and quietly. How did you get the vice president smiling so genially uh, at, at, at all times so that, uh, or is he just a genial fella? Jim Lake or no one else in the campaign got George Bush to smile. He is a genial fellow. He's a fellow who's very comfortable with himself, and he has, it has an advantage over Governor Dukakis. He's done this before. He's been out campaigning in the 1980 campaign, the 1984 campaign, and you learned through experience uh, the comfort with the camera, the comfort with the questions, and, and with the kind of format that the Ameri campaigning in American politics today requires. And plus, he is a fat, natural, easygoing, very likable fellow, and it conveys when he's... Well, if he's so uh, hold it, hold it, Sam. Let's, uh, let's, why let's, did he use cue cards when he came down last night to say thanks, it looks like I'm the next president? Why did he read it from the cue cards? Because, uh, Sam, you know, he's, that was a... The next president of the United States, for the very first time, addressed me in public, has an, had a, an important message to convey. He can't do it from his heart? I, he, he heard it from his heart, but he wanted to be precise and careful, and I think he was. Because his message not only goes to the American people, it goes to all of our, it, it goes to the competitors, went to Governor Dukakis, it went to the world, the world leaders. And you mean to say, I'm delighted I won, Gorbachev is listening, one wrong word, and World War III? Now, come on, Jim. As Kirk would say, I give you that. <laughs> you. Let's, I'll tell you what, I, I give you the next question. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Koppel. Uh, this question is going to Mr. Russert from NBC, and you can all take a jab at it if you like. It's really on the, uh, the, the role of the media. In the media today, they like to claim that, you know, they're objective and they're really not influenced by the fact that they are commercial arms of commercial uh, entities, that is, the networks. And so what I'd like to ask is, isn't there a, a, a premium put on ratings and drama and tension? And because of this, if the candidates want to talk about issues, don't they have to work through the soundbite, you know, sort of medium if they want to work within the uh, system that's imposed on them by the nature of the media? Tim? I think that uh, ratings, we live with ratings and we live with finances, and obviously that's important. I've been thinking about the previous question, and it relates to yours, about what mistakes we made, what mea culpa, what could we have done better? Uh, the two things, I, in my mind, are the campaign ads, the way we cover them, and the debates. 
uh, just on the ad, nothing is seen by more people in this country than the campaign ad. Every night in their living room, prime time, daytime, morning, as opposed to the news shows, which are much lower rated. And I do think the campaign ads just have to be analyzed and dissected by the media in such a vigorous way. I was asking, when I saw some of the ads on the, on, on the air, I asked our people at NBC and Standards and Practices and Advertising, what are the ground rules? I mean, if someone comes on, Leslie's husband wrote a piece for the Washington Post last week in which he said, 1968, the big fear was that, my God, candidates are going to start imitating advertisers and package candidates like soap studs. And 20 years later, if a company began to imitate politics and, camp and, and package their soap studs like a candidate, they would, be, uh, would lose an awful lot of credibility for their product. And the response to me was that the candidate can say anything he wants, and the network must put it on, other than the seven George Carlin words. The, the network must put it on. And all the more reason that we in the media, and, I, and my view is in 92 or in local races, is take every commercial, dissect it, ask for the research material that supports it, and I, I would suggest that print do the same. Otherwise, it, it just goes unresponded to in, in a very good way. And secondly, to your question about debates, I think that the way the debates were organized this year and the panels were selected did reflect poorly on the media. And it's in, in no way a poor reflection on the organization that did it, because it's basically from off. But I do think the networks have to be much more aggressive and say that the three networks will have debates, uh, the anchors will, have, will each take one, and simply have the two candidates and one moderator, and let them go at it for three hours the way they did in Canada, and you'll have a real sense of the person, a much more real sense of the person. You know, I am left, Jim Lake, with a feeling, particularly on the issue of the debates, that somehow this was, this was really up for negotiation. It wasn't really up for negotiation, was it? I mean, George Bush didn't want to do more than two debates, and when Jim Baker and Paul Brothers sat down, uh, Paul Kirk, you correct me if I'm wrong, there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room there. We are wrong. Kirk? I'm not Paul Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take your friend, I'd take your friend Kirk O'Donnell. I, I am wrong. But am I, am, I wrong on the, am I wrong on the point that there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room on the, on the discussion over the debate? I wasn't in those discussions, uh, but uh, I, uh, we weren't in what one would say a commanding position from our uh, position at that point. Well, that's an issue of nego negotiations. Uh, one side comes in and says, this is what we'd like. The other side comes in and says, this is what we'd like, and you discuss it. Okay, but we're talking about the public out here. If, if the public had said this time around, uh, you know, I don't care who's ahead or who's behind, what we'd really like to see is a wide open debate between the two candidates and keep everybody else out of it, except the timekeeper, maybe. I mean, someone to say, you know, Mr. Vice President, you've just had 10 minutes, now it's the governor's turn. You guys wouldn't have gone for that this time, would you? The uh, debates worked uh, very well. I thought the American people got a good chance to see both candidates, all four candidates. Thank you. <laughs> but, but Ted, let me just... Yeah. All four candidates in a very uh, aggressive exchange. I thought there was uh, plenty of opportunity for, to have Vice President Bush, uh, Mr. Dukakis, looked at carefully and their views uh, well known. I think the questioners were tough uh, and I thought that the answers uh, exposed the candidates for views on a lot of things. Let us wrap it up on this point. We're going to go around one more time. Very Jim good. Resser, Jim, go ahead. The three networks in 1992 said that you were going to have three nights, 90 minutes. And we offered the time and if one of the candidates doesn't show, there's an empty chair. I dare say we'd have three interesting debates. We'll see what happens. I think that, uh, in fact, the media could have done much more of that this year. They could have smoked out both candidates much more than they did and forced them to answer questions. Uh, by doing, uh, Sam was talking about what he did before, by showing Michael Dukakis not answering a question. I think you can do the same thing. You can lead your broadcast by uh, showing how George Bush is staying away from questions. The point is that the White House or a campaign needs television just as much as vice versa, and I wish that uh, the networks would have uh, realized that and acted upon it a little bit more often, I think we would have heard a lot more interesting conversation. I think that uh, all three networks hit George Bush pretty hard, pretty persistently for not responding to questions over and over in this campaign. Um, I'm real curious, can I ask a question of, uh, of Jim? When the networks did analyze the tank ads and the furlough ad and sh showed that they were distortions, why weren't they taken off the air right away? Why did you stay with them when it was proved? They they, they were not distortions. Yes, they, they were, were not and they were shown they were without question. And in fact, we had a press conference. Why are you, why are you no, seriously, we why had, no. are you sticking with it? Because they were accurate. 
No, they weren't. They were we, not we, accurate. We, we had a press conference in which it was, they were fully documented. All the facts were laid out to the full press conference where your network and everyone else's network here was attendance, as well as many other people from the national networks, and no one ever challenged that. I challenged it on the air. Not, at, I, not, at, not after our portrayal of our information, not yes, after, after your challenged. portrayal. Well, you know, it's, it's an we interesting That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell you, in a political debate, as far as that concerns, any sort of debate in our democracy, you have a right to lie. I'm not recommending it. I don't think it ought to be rewarded. And I think reporters have an obligation to try to nail a lie when it happens. But if someone wants to put on an ad which is an absolute lie, I think they ought to have a right to do it in politics. But they do have the But right. it ought to be the opponent's first duty to nail it. It ought to be reporter's duty to nail it. But in the final analysis, if the American people love it, I got to tell you, Ted, they get to vote any way they want to. Sam, so I always thought that the whole reason for the reporter and the free press was to keep the politicians honest. And that's what we I try to that's do. That's what it was about. That's what we try to do. And but if all they, we if can do is this so-called right to lie. Uh, it shouldn't just take a, an attack from the from the opposition. I mean, I, it, I've felt with all reporters that that, no, that, that, that motivated them more than anything else. I put more things in the air, I'm not going to name any names, that completely demonstrate that someone has said something which is totally untrue. And when I was young and naive, I expected the American public to rise up and say, ha, huh, totally untrue? We're going to punish that person. And I discovered it didn't happen. No, but that's not the often. public's role, that's your role. Well, it's I mean, my role know, to I... expose a lie but it's not my role to then beat these good Do people over the head and Do you put lies on the air without saying they're lying? No, I say they're lies if I think and, they're and, lies. And you say, when you say there's a li it's a lie, that the public doesn't react to that? Oh, let me... I don't want to name names, Kirk, but I'm telling you something. We put on the air constantly a well, correction of the truth. Let's not use the word lie. Well, but you did use the word lie. I did lie. use the word lie because I said people You said there a was right a right to, to lie. There is a right to lie. It's not good policy. I don't advise it. I think it's unethical, and I think it ought to be rewarded with defeat when a political candidate does it. I have never seen this right to lie in any uh, in the Constitution. I haven't seen this right well, to lie. Well, have you seen the Constitution fact, say fact, you have a right to lie? If you send a lie through the, the mails, you can be prosecuted by the federal government. Now, this is extraordinary. To the as Mrs. Right Lillian used you know, to say a, about a, Jimmy a, Carter, did you never tell a lie in your life, Kurt? What? Did you never tell a lie in your life? I told lies. Okay. We're not going to castigate you and put you up by the news. But what I haven't told you on this program... If you do it as a... Well, I haven't either. If Kirk, you do it the, as a politician... Uh, the, point the, the, point that Tim Russell, the point that Tim Russell was making before, though, I think, I, I think is a useful point to return to. And that I is, don't want to return to no, that. But, but to go back <laughs> we are talking. I want to go back to the right to lie. That's exactly... No, no, hang in. I find it an listen, extraordinary listen, thing. Listen to me for a moment, because I am talking about that. In point of fact... If this campaign or your campaign creates, for example, a political ad which is replete with lies, the networks do not have the right to refuse it. You do have the right to get it on our air, whether we want to or not. Listen, let me tell you something. I got an ad. We, we uh, in 1982, uh, got uh, an ad off the air that the Republican uh, Congressional Campaign Committee uh, put on in the 82 election by going to the networks, and they refused them. You refuse ads from independent political committees we can all the time. We can refuse them. We can refuse them from a biscuit company or a gasoline no, no, company. We cannot refuse them in a presidential campaign. If you guys come up with an ad and it is just lies one through ten, is, we got to put it on. Candidate, this candidate's campaign appears anywhere in the ad, we cannot reject it. As the candidate's name appears. I listen that's to different. Michael Dukakis. That is not what was put forward. Almost when a every candidate's day. name is in. It's a different every situation. day from the stump, I listen to Michael Dukakis almost every day in the last three weeks accuse the Bush campaign of not only distortion, but outright lies. Right. He was trying to hit the commercial. Now, Mr. Lake, however, will not accept that it was a lie. He says it was valid advertising. My point no, is... I said more than that. I said it was the truth, Sam. Well, I, he said it's the truth. Maybe it's a lie. He has the right to put it on. And we you have a right to call it a lie. If I think as a there reporter no it doesn't right meet to the facts... There, there, there are no well, right to put lies on. Who defines the lie? I mean, they, you can find out whether something objectively the is true That's or untrue. The is to define the lie. Uh, the public relies on the press to separate facts the right from fiction. The concept is That's your job. Hold on just one second, because I think you've, you've touched on a very interesting point here. There is a difference between fact and truth. If President Reagan tomorrow were to go on the air and hold a news conference at 5.30 in the af afternoon and talk about that well-known drug dealer, Ted Koppel, 
you would all be perfectly within your rights to put it on the air that the President of the United States had accused me of being a drug dealer. Would it be true? No. Would it be a fact that the President had said it? Yes. Would the networks be justified in putting it on the air? Would the Washington Post be justified in putting it on the front page if it chose to? Absolutely. Mr. But Reagan he... said Dukakis was an invalid. But the... Now, but... was that the truth? It, it, objectively? No. Did the president Obviously. have a right to say it? Uh, he, uh, well, he apologized, Well, you've taken this mighty attitude. How extraordinary the right to lie. You say it's not the truth. Did he have a right to say it? Well, as he said, he wasn't saying it as an objective fact. He was saying it as a piece of humor. And that's the way he characterized it. Well, it I think a lot of people, including Kitty it, Dukakis, didn't think it was very funny. Uh, but Michael Dukakis decided not to to attack him for it, to criticize him for it, because he understood it was a mistake in terms of, the, of humor. And as far as what Ted said, Joe McCarthy found out that if you said there were 37, that the State Department had a list of 37 people that went out on AP and UPI, and that was the key to uh, McCarthy's initial success before the press and other people began to stand up to these sorts of charges. Joe Sam's McCarthy point. That's Sam's point. had a right to say it, and he ought to have been nailed for it, as he, he ultimately wasn't. was. But it, how long did he, take? he was seven years have been to get nailed, nailed for it earlier. But he had the right to say it. Campaigns I am don't not last seven the years. kind of a censor or a god who can say, Kurt O'Donnell has just said this, or Michael Dukakis, or Vice President Bush. But I am not going to put it on the air, because I personally find it either distasteful or wrong. But you should know the issues well enough so that if something right. does come on the air about somebody's defense position, that you can point out that it's not correct. Now, I, make, I make an effort to do that uh, two or three times in the campaign. I must say Governor Dukakis did not do it often, or if he did, he put it over me. Generally. He said things which I thought were wrong, and I immediately said them as part of my report that the fact was just the opposite. Sam, Sam excuse me. All this debate about to lie or right to lie sort of presumes that somehow the Bush campaign ads that we were talking about uh, were replete with lies. It's not the fact. Tim had made the point earlier that every campaign ad ought to be uh, verified. It ought to be, uh, all the facts ought to be laid out in his suggestion for improvements for the future. In fact, we did that. Every single thing that was quoted in the tank ad and in the Boston Harbor ad was validated before a full-blown full press conference in Washington, D.C. And validated those are not lying. lies. We, they were validated with quotes out of Michael Dukakis' right. own campaign literature, own speeches, right. and own public let, policy let, let positions. Let me tell you what, what we said was a distortion. In the revolving door furlough ad, the announcer comes on and says, under Michael Dukakis' furlough program, murderers, convicted murderers, uh, sentenced without parole, were allowed uh, out. Correct. And while the announcer is saying murderers, on the screen comes the words, 268 escaped. Now, the 268 escaped were not murderers. They were everybody in the entire program. We in, didn't say murderers, 268 murderers escaped. No, it said 268 escaped. The truth is four murderers escaped. 268 referred to everybody in the entire program released on furlough. That's what we said. No. You're presuming. No, you didn't say that. Yeah, what that, that it said 268 escaped, escaped furloughed prisoners. The no, only, it just the said only 268 escaped while the announcer said what I just said, that under Michael Dukakis' furlough program, murderers were allowed out on weekends. And they were, for the only program okay. in the nation. I understand just they were. Like I understand they were. But I say that when the announcer says murderers and you have on your screen 268 escaped, that what you're saying is 268 murderers. In other words, we, we did you not are, say that. In other words, you're you're are allowing, you are allowing the public to draw an incorrect inference. You may even be leading the public toward drawing an, in, an incorrect inference. The facts are murderers escaped. But it's Jim, the only program in the, in the only pro furlough program in the nation that furloughed uh, murderers that were without Jim, possibility of parole. Just, just and 268 furloughed prisoners did escape. Right. Jim, Let me ask you a question, Jim. Under the, under, the, under the guise of fairness, when in my business, if I say something in a, in a story uh, no, about what? anybody and I put up numbers on the screen, they should match what I say. And if they don't, I am inaccurate. And that's fair. What was, the, so, what was the antecedent to the 268? The only antecedent I see it is murderers. Yeah, just that 268. And also to take two commercials. One was the, the tank commercial, Dukakis, that he opposed the stealth, when in fact 
he had announced his support for the stealth. It, but it, take the under pressure at a later date. At, at a later date, but under pressure from George Bush. But, that, but, but that's not in the commercial. It said opposed. But also in the caucus commercial that Bush cut Social Security when in fact he didn't vote. He, he did. Cut he did he voted to Social three years. No, he didn't. Three. He Enough. didn't do that. You know it better than anybody else because you developed the Social Security issue with Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And I can't imagine that Moynihan would look to you as his former chief aide and say did he that when, the, you, did take, he when you take something that's in law, which is a right to a cost of living increase, and you cut that cost of living increase right that's in law to a freeze to a previous number, that that isn't cutting a benefit that someone has a right now, to receive. Do we have a lie going around here one way or the other? I'll tell you what, folks, what we do have is a need to bring this thing <laughs> to, a, to, to, to a conclusion. So <laughs> let, let, us, let, us, let us go from, uh, well, I'll tell you what, we, we'll give these folks the last word. So, Sam, you take the first word. How, how do you want to wrap this thing up? Well, I guess where I began. I've enjoyed the debate tonight. As I said earlier, we all better have a pretty thick skin. And that is that in covering a political campaign, I don't get to say what the campaign is. The candidate and his managers get to say what kind of campaign they want to run. I ought to report it. If there is a lie, I ought to expose it. If it doesn't fit the facts or if it's not in context, I ought to say that as a reporter. Finally, the American people get to decide whose campaign they respond to, which candidate they want to vote for. And I may disagree with them. I may vote for the other guy, but it's not my place to tell them how to vote. Leslie. I think we all agonize uh, in, in our end, in the television reporter end, uh, how to get around the problem. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I appreciate, Ted, that you gave us this chance to discuss with the so-called other side. Uh, there aren't easy solutions. We haven't come close to finding them. I hope we can give the American people a better campaign next time, both sides. But you know, we go on to cover this presidency, and these problems aren't going to go away because we're not covering a campaign. The same problems will exist now in covering uh, President Bush because will he come and answer questions? Uh, are we going to have a picture presidency? I mean, I think the, the problems of covering the campaign are going to be the problems of covering all the issues in Washington, and they're going to be very hard. They're going to be tough issues to put on television, the budget deficit. Uh, we already know how hard that is. People, we've done many stories on them. I think the, the American people think we haven't done any. So. We haven't solved the problems of the campaign, and we're moving into the next phase of this problem with the issues still unsolved. We need more discussion. Tim Russer. The theme of tonight is, uh, was the 88 campaign, who's to blame? We all are. Uh, media is not perfect. God's not finished with us yet. Uh, if there's one thing that's important, uh, in my mind, it is these campaign ads and our vigilance to cope with them and to dissect them and to report on them. Because I think we now have a situation where negative campaigning, negative advertising is alive and well in presidential races. We have guaranteed that any president coming to office is going to have a 40% negative rating. And that's not quite good for a democracy. Jim Lake. Yeah, there's n I don't think there's any extraordinary difference in the 1988 presidential campaign with regard to negative campaigning than has ever been in any other campaign. I do think, however, the American people deserve uh, better exposition of where the public, where the candidates stand on the facts where they stand on the issues. And I think we both have a responsibility there, both the candidates to continue to articulate, to continue to pound away, even when those network producers say there was no soundbite, to continue to articulate the, their position on, in that case, uh, defense policy and foreign policy again and again and again, and to force the networks to have to do it. And the networks need to do a better job of fully exploring, as it, Leslie has done and Sam has done in some of their pieces. And as you have done in your Nightline show, unfortunately, at the hour that you, you're on, everybody doesn't get to watch Nightline. I think we need to do a better job so the American people can be better informed about the people that they're giving a chance to vote for. Kirk O'Donnell. Well, I think we've seen from this campaign that negative campaigning can indeed be a winning strategy. It's a winning strategy for elections. It's not a winning strategy for governing the country. George Bush is going into a situation in which, because he spent so much time on the negative, there's no positive, there's no mandate, there's no clear agenda. Under those circumstances, not only do uh, the press and the campaign suffer in a negative campaign, but the country may well suffer. Mark Hertzger. Well, I feel a little odd being on this side of the table, uh, being associated with the handlers, if you will, because I think that, um, in fact, the problem rests both with the handlers and with the press, and that part of the reason that uh, 
the public is so dissatisfied with the uh, campaign this year. It's not so much negative. Some of the, were some of the things they called Abraham Lincoln uh, would curl your hair. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have not talked about the real issues, and I think that that is a result of the perverse symbiosis that has grown up over the last eight years between the PR approach to politics that's been championed by the Reagan White House and lives on in the Bush campaign, and the uh, increasingly deferential and show business oriented approach to journalism that's increasingly practiced by the major news organizations. I don't expect the handlers to change. I expect that uh, of them. They are paid to win elections. I do expect more of the press. Their role in our system is to keep the authorities honest, and not to be political eunuchs. Well, let me... Uh, oh. Let me indulge uh, myself just to the point of, of making a couple of quick comments. I do think we have been living in rather extraordinary times because things appear to be rather cloudless. The horizon seems rather cloudless at the moment. Uh, perhaps it is easier for a, ca uh, for a campaign to get caught up uh, in, the, in the sort of squalor that has attached itself to this one. I rather suspect that as our national problems become more apparent to us, that the next campaign, whoever is running, uh, we will not be indulging in this kind of conversation when it's all over. I think inevitably the candidates will hold one another's feet to the fire on issues because it will be the issues that concern the voting public. In any event, I'm very grateful to all of you and to our audience here and our audience at home for staying with us to this late hour. We have quite obviously gone well beyond our allotted time, but we're grateful to you for sticking with us. I'm Ted Copley in New York. For all of us here at ABC News, thank you and good night. This has been ABC News Viewpoint. If you wish a printed transcript, please send $5 to Viewpoint Transcripts. Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 1007. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.